Ah, this will interest you, gentlemen. Over here. Hello and welcome to the Cosm Podcast. I'm your host, Tyler James Berger. On this third interview I conducted for our Bicycle Day event, I talked with Dr. Julie Holland, a psychopharmacologist and psychiatrist who has written extensively on the risks, benefits, and clinical applications of psychedelic substances, as well as being incredibly knowledgeable about the neurochemistry of the mystical experience. I learned so much from talking with her, and I know you will too. So without any further ado, please welcome Dr. Julie Holland. All right, I'm here with Dr. Julie Holland. Um, We're here on the occasion that April 19th is a high holiday known as Bicycle Day, celebrating Albert Hoffman's discovery of LSD. Um, But before we get into that, Julie Holland, I want to ask you, um, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your background and your experience? Sure, Tyler, I love talking about me. (laughs) Let's see. Um, I am a 54-year-old woman. I am married with two children. They are 19 and 15. Uh, When I was 19, I was uh, an undergrad, like that seamless segue. I was an undergrad at Penn, um, and I was uh, a total pre-med, planning on going to medical school, thought I might be like a neurosurgeon or a neurologist or a psychiatrist. I knew I was very interested in the brain, very interested in drugs. And when I was at college, it sort of just became very clear to me that I should be a psychiatrist, that uh, the way drugs affect behavior is really fascinating to me. So uh, I finished up at Penn. I took a year off uh, to sing in a rock band and ride a motorcycle and get a little bit of my yayas out. But then I stayed in Philly. I went to Temple Med School. Uh, While I was at Temple, I did some research on, on schizophrenia and auditory hallucinations. Um, I ended up in New York City at Mount Sinai, where I did my residency. And while I was at Mount Sinai, I was doing research on schizophrenia. And um, I did a rotation at Bellevue Hospital working in their psych ER. And I became enamored of emergency psychiatry. And uh, I ended up taking a job at Bellevue once I left Mount Sinai. And so for nine years, I worked every Saturday night and Sunday night uh, as the doctor in charge of the psychiatric emergency room at Bellevue Hospital. Um, And I wrote a memoir of that time called Weekends at Bellevue. Um, And uh, I've always been very interested in uh, insanity and psychosis and alternate realities and whether people get there on their own chemistry or whether they get there by taking something exogenously. uh, To me, they're equally interesting and and worthy of my time and attention. So I'm, I'm very interested in altered states of consciousness that are induced either uh, from somebody's own chemistry or or from some external chemical source. Um, and happy high holidays to everybody. Uh, this is a really magical time of year for me. Uh, I love the high holidays. I've, I've called them the high holidays for a very long time. And I, I, you know, I include 420 and Bicycle Day and Earth Day. Uh, there is a little bit of a push now for 421 to be a, a fungi, psilocybin day. Um, the day I met my husband, which was at a party for Terrence McKenna, that was on 417. So I kind of lumped that into the high holidays and my son's birthday is on Earth Day. So a very magical time of the year for me, but also uh, at Bellevue, this time of year traditionally was what I would call mania season, uh, which is when some people with bipolar disorder would be more likely to have a hypomanic or a manic episode. Um, And even people who aren't necessarily cyclical may notice at this time of year in the spring that they've got a little bit more spring in their own steps and they've got a few more plans. Um, It's a high energy time for a lot of us and it's a time of rebirth. Um, And I'm really delighted to be with the Cosm family to celebrate Bicycle Day. Yeah, well, we're happy to have you and kind of dig, dig in a little bit more on this subject. you know, I want to ask you, what are some of the qualities of the LSD experience that to you are the most mysterious from a uh, psychopharmacological perspective? Well, I think um, 
as I hardly know where to start. So um, as someone who has had some personal experience with these uh, intense altered states, and as somebody who has witnessed them in others quite a bit, um, the, the one that I sort of hang my hat on that I am most interested in is this idea that sometimes when people are peaking on psychedelics, they have this sense um, that everything is connected, uh, that uh, not only is everything connected, but that uh, whoever is doing the tripping or the experience is, is fully jacked into that experience. You know, everything is connected and I am part of the connection. Um, and this sense that there is sort of a, a universal, uh, I believe Alex Gray sometimes will call this like a universal lattice work, you know, of energy that connects everyone and everything. I think that when you're in this heightened altered state, you can be really clued into that, that reality that everything really is connected and that a lot of our sense of illusion, uh, a lot of our sense of separation is really an illusion or just constructs that make it easier for us to understand things or see things. So this idea of oneness, which is a, a part of a mystical experience, um, you can get that sense of oneness and of belonging and of connection um, without LSD. So um, I've spent the last few years uh, researching this idea of connection and sort of looking at the science of connection and the pharmacology of connection and what is really happening chemically when we have this sense that everything is connected or that we are connected to everything or that we belong. Um, and I kept coming back to oxytocin as being one of the sort of chemical foundations of this sense of connection, of bonding, of trust and belonging. Um, and there's lots of, of natural examples of, of oxytocin being increased, for instance, in a, let's say a, a woman who is nursing or breastfeeding a baby, that's a very high oxytocin state. Childbirth is a high oxytocin state. Uh, orgasm. Um, which some people would say has something to do with bonding and connection and trust and oneness. Orgasm is a high oxytocin state. So I, I was looking to LSD and other uh, classical uh, psychedelics and trying to figure out, okay, so where's the oxytocin? I mean, clearly these are states of connection and bonding and oneness. Where's the oxytocin? But I couldn't find any papers that said LSD increases oxytocin. Um, but what I finally learned actually about a year ago now was right, I was right before I was going to give a talk at Esalen. Um, and that morning I got an email from a, from a researcher that I had been in touch with a woman named, um, Oh, I don't want to get her no, name wrong. <laughs> her last name is Shellen Krantz. Um, and I believe her first name is Heidi, but I'm afraid it may be Helen, but, um, uh, I'll get back to you on that. Uh, anyway, and and the notes for this conversation are in uh, a book that I'm coming out with soon that I'll mention in a minute. Anyway, what she taught me is that there is actually a situation where the 5-HT2A receptor, which is what I like to think of as a psychedelic receptor, right? We know psilocybin, LSD, uh, they tickle this 5-HT2A receptor. They, they are agonists for it. and um, But it turns out that that receptor creates a bonding pair with another receptor, it creates something called a dimer. It dimerizes. The 5-HT2A receptor dimerizes with another receptor when it is stimulated enough. And lo and behold, that other receptor that it couples with is the oxytocin receptor. So um, there is this sort of uh, crosstalk or bleed through uh, where in in psychedelic states you do have an increase of oxytocin um, and actually where you see that most clearly is with MDMA and now MDMA is not a classical psychedelic and it is now MDMA does not yet have its own bicycle day so that is a bit of an aside but I will just say as an aside that we know that MDMA markedly increases oxytocin levels and gives people that sense of openness and trusting and bonding and I will say one more thing <laughs> about openness and trusting and bonding uh, and the sense that we're all connected and we're all in this together is uh, that is often something that is really missed from today's politics. Um, and something that many of us would like to get back to is, is this sort of transition from me to we, you know, and let's make sure everybody has what they need and not just certain people have what they need. And that is really all about oxytocin um, and sharing. And I think, and something I wrote about in this book, that I'm coming out with soon is um, that we can talk about psychedelics and government and we could talk about psychedelics and uh, eco uh, 
sort of uh, ecological um, activism, say, um, or just uh, eco-consciousness. Uh, many of us who have had altered states where we feel everything is connected, one of the things you come away with from that message is that you know we're connected to the earth and we are part of the earth and nature is a part of us and you can't separate uh, humans from plants and animals and that we need to take care of the earth. And I think a lot of us who have had altered states feel very strongly that we need to take care of the earth and that uh, how we treat the environment really matters and the sort of environmental consciousness that gets uh, fed by our mystical experiences. It's important for our evolution. It's important for government. So uh, a bit of an aside, <laughs> um, your turn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, uh, from kind of this evolutionary perspective, uh, why do you think the human brain even has the capacity to experience these states of oceanic oneness in the first place? Are these chemicals like simply random exogenous things that uh, kind of short circuit our brain to have this experience? Or do you think this experience is something that you know, we're capable of because it's evolutionarily advantageous. So I do think that people are naturally capable of having this sense of oceanic boundlessness. It is not only people who trip that get to experience this mystical oneness. And I think that people who, I mean, there's lots of other ways to get there, um, which is something I talk about in this book. It, you know, it's not just drugs. Uh, first of all, you, you can have a sense of oceanic boundlessness from a huge orgasm where you sort of leave your body and like, I don't know where I went there for a minute, but it was big and vast where I was. That can be a sense of boundlessness. Um, floating in a sensory deprivation tank or just even, you know, floating on a, on a lake or a pond. If you happen to be alone, you can have a sense of not really knowing where you end and the water begins. Uh, being enveloped in mist can make you feel sort of connected to the earth. Um, there, there are all these states, I would say, that have to do with meditation or chanting or dancing um, or any sort of repetitive rhythmic uh, stimulus that can get you to a place where you lose yourself. And even, you know, the littler states of that, I would say something like flow, right? Where you get so into what you're doing, uh, whether it's making art or making music or perhaps making music with your friends. But at some point when you're in that flow, you really, you lose yourself in the doing or in the being. Um, and that is a state of oneness. So, uh, you know, as much as we're here today to talk about LSD, there are, there are other ways to to get in a mystical state but uh the truth is um that these are catalysts that help you get to a place that can be pretty tough to get to on your own and they can get you there much more easily yeah and these states have like you've said clear advantages uh you know not in the least shifting from a me to we perspective which is such an argument against one of the original names of psychedelic chemicals when you know psychiatrists used to call them psychodomimetics that right. they, that they mimic psychosis and right. this is just such an obvious argument against that position um, I know you've had a lot of experience uh, studying what we might call insanity. Um, and, you know, can you just speak a little bit about the differences between the states we find ourselves in when we take psychedelics and what you would classically call insanity? Sure. Tricky question. So, um, yeah, I definitely try not to use words like psychotomimetic. Another word that I try to avoid is hallucinogen. Um, although it's harder to avoid the latter. Um, but, but the idea is that, that back in the 50s and 60s, when we didn't have good models, uh, animal models, of, of what psychosis looked like, these drugs gave us a better model than anything. I mean, now we actually know that if you're looking at schizophrenia and you need an animal model for schizophrenia, you don't use LSD or psilocybin. You would actually use a PCP or perhaps ketamine, which more accurately models um, what a schizophrenic psychosis looks like. But the, the peak of a psilocybin or LSD experience can look a bit like a, a manic episode or a hypomanic episode um, in that some of the, you know, I have seen 
people come into the psych ER who were manic, had not ingested any psychedelic whatsoever, but their pupils were dilated and they sure were talking like, you know, my tripping friends from high school used to talk, you know, where I, I felt very comfortable with them and, and uh, engaging and engaging them in, in sort of their worldview. I mean, the, uh, one of the cases I wrote about in Weekends at Bellevue actually was somebody who came from a, from a Cosm, uh, I won't say a, a party or a function because they just had gone to Cosm. Uh, but but they had been they had taken uh, mushrooms and gone to Cosm and had such an intense experience there that they when they left Cosm they basically went out on the street and were like giving away their money giving away their wallet and their and their watches and saying you know I uh, I don't need to have my possessions anymore we're all connected everything is connected um, they end up being brought to Bellevue and like uh, other doctors I think would look at them and think that they were manic or in a manic episode and it was only because this person had mentioned. Uh, Chapel of Sacred Mirrors that I was Which like, Wait. We, we do not advocate that. Please do not no. come here and just like thinking to it's a place to do that. We definitely don't advocate for that, but yes, continue. Right. Um, so I didn't mean to imply that you, that anyone ever advocated this and this, this seriously was like 15 years ago or so, but my, but my point about talking about this was that, um, that when somebody is high on classical psychedelics, they can look a little bit like they're manic, um, as opposed to the psychosis of schizophrenia, which is a, a bit more of a, of a paranoid flavor, typically, and a, a bit more of a disorganized speech. Um, but in general, the, these aren't good models for psychosis, and they really have been abandoned as, as good models for psychosis. And now what's lovely that's happening in psychiatry is that we're looking to the psychedelics um not as models of illness but as avenues for treatment and as as uh, models of wellness and and being able to use things like like psilocybin or mdma or lsd um to help people process their traumas obviously this is this is the part <laughs> that i'm much more interested in um you know, uh, uh, as with many things uh, that I study, the the harms are overstated and the benefits are understated when it comes to things like LSD or psilocybin or MDMA uh, or cannabis. Um, for a long time, there there has been a resistance in sort of mainstream medicine and NIH and NIMH. Um, you know, that they're only willing to look at these chemicals in terms of the the harm that they can reek as opposed to the benefits they can impart and it's really a lovely time to be a psychiatrist now because we're having different conversations and we're and we're admitting that these are actually medicines that can really help people and particularly that they can be used as catalysts in psychiatry so um as we all know it's it's very much about you know set and setting and uh how much you can reduce the potential for harm and and maximize the potential for benefit and it all really comes down to being very educated about what you're taking um having access to something that is pure and a knowable substance you know one of the issues as we all know with our current drug policy is that it's harder to know uh what you're taking or how much of what you're taking um when it's not being uh, regulated or uh, monitored at all. So this is sort of the number one harm is, uh, you know, drug substitution and counterfeit drugs and not knowing what you're taking. And then the number two harm is not being properly educated to know in advance what you're getting yourself into, how long it's going to last, making sure you are somewhere where you aren't going to be paranoid, where you're going to feel safe. You know, this idea of safety is so important. And, and part of the lack of safety is that you have to hide it. You can't be honest about what you're doing. And that, you know, as soon as you hide, you're adding this adrenaline and fear and you're already affecting your experience. So to be somewhere where it is allowed, which unfortunately because of our nation's drug policy, um, that's nowhere <laughs> except in a research setting. So that's a big part of the problem, right? Our drug policy is getting in the way of our uh, sort of gaining maximum benefit from these medicines. And that's nothing new. <laughs> yeah, what, what do you think is um, the first step, some of the first steps in reintroducing psychedelics into society responsibly? Yeah. 
Well, there's a few avenues. I mean, one, the one that we all know is happening is that medical research is moving forward and, you know, following the rules and doing what FDA says and doing what DEA says and still getting, getting good data. That's what's happening now. And it's happening not just in America, but all around the world. Um, and we could have a very long discussion about, you know, that's not the only way to do it. The medical model is not the only one. People can get benefit from other models. Yes, of course they can. However, um, that is sort of, you know, the mo this is like the model we have. This is what we're stuck with. We have to work within these guidelines. And so we are following a medical model. Um, so, sorry, I'm getting lost. What was the question again? <laughs> uh, yeah, just uh, reintroducing, you know, ther the therapeutic use of psychedelics is clearly the first step right. in reintroducing right. it into society. But, uh, you know, how do you envision uh, them being integrated even beyond a therapeutic model? Yeah. So, well, one of my visions, so, okay, so we have the medical model and that's all sort of well and good. I'm very interested in the decriminalized nature uh, approach where people in, in certain communities are sort of petitioning the local government um, that things that are grown naturally, things like um, like psilocybin or ayahuasca or cannabis, you know, these are natural plants that we're growing and we should be allowed to ingest whatever plant we want to. So I think that that's another way that you're making these things visible. Then the other thing is um, writing books, uh, people, uh, or maybe uh, something I've been trying to pitch forever, which is like a scripted uh, television series that features um, psychedelics um, in, in a realistic way and not in a, you know, a sort of a fanciful or clickbait kind of a way. So getting it more into popular culture is a way to just expose more people to these ideas. And especially if these, if these substances in, in these scripted shows are shown as medicines, as, as potentially having a benefit. So that's another way. Uh, and then the other big way is for people to just out themselves. You know, I, I, like, I like to think of 420 as a day when people can out themselves as cannabis users and, and 419 as a day when people can out themselves as sort of responsible psychedelic users. Coming out of the psychedelic closet, right? Exactly. And I get that we can't all do that. I mean, you know, one of the best things that ever happened to me, although it killed me when it happened, was I, I lost my faculty appointment at, at NYU. Um, mostly honestly because I was I was talking to Bill O'Reilly about the fact that I thought that um, psilocybin mushrooms and ayahuasca could be beneficial and somebody at Bellevue saw it and got freaked out and uh, uh, anyway the long story short is that I, I became a free agent you know I was with NYU Bellevue I thought that I would always be a faculty person there I thought that I would do research there but when I lost that faculty appointment it really did allow me uh, to be completely free and say whatever the hell I want and be more of an advocate uh, and out myself more without, without fearing repercussions. So I get that not everybody can out themselves as a responsible psychedelic user or a responsible cannabis user, uh, but if you can, you must. Well, I mean, speaking of getting out, getting ideas out there in a responsible way, tell me a little bit about your book that you've mentioned. I'm so glad you asked, Tyler. Thanks for asking about my book. I just happen to have a copy here. What do you know? What do we so, have? This is called, is it coming up backwards? It's just me. Oh, no, I can see it. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's just me. It's good. Um, boomer. So uh, the book is called Good Chemistry. Uh, the Science of Connection from Soul to Psychedelics. And it's set up in chapters. The first chapter is about the self, and it's about connecting to the self, uh, becoming embodied, uh, having some emotional integrity and authenticity, what it means to connect to yourself, and how you can use things like cannabis or MDMA or psychedelics to help forge a very strong connection with yourself. Second chapter is about connecting with a partner, Third ch chapter is about connecting with a family, which some of us are getting a crash course in currently. Uh, fourth chapter is about connecting with society and community. And that's where I talk a bit about um, dance and, and chanting and singing and music and large gatherings and things like Burning Man. But also I talk about government and, and the idea of oxytocin and how it plays out in government and this idea of us versus them uh, versus we um, and that and then there's a chapter on connecting with nature um, and 
death and the cosmos. And so that's more where I am talking again about, about how psychedelics can play a part in helping us connect to nature, which also I think cannabis really can help you feel connected to nature. Um, and uh, dealing with the fact that we're all gonna die and how, how much of an impact that has on how we live our lives now. And I think we're seeing a lot of that right now um, with COVID-19, uh, just how that sort of denial of death and fear of death can play out uh, in our government in our responses to the pandemic. So, uh, so it starts small with like just, you know, connection with the self, connection with a partner, with a family, with community, with nature, with the cosmos. And so you end up with this idea that everything is connected and we're all connected. Um, and now, you know, go forth and, and do good. So that's, that's pretty much good chemistry. I talk a lot about oxytocin and a lot about our own uh, in a chemistry that makes us feel good that has nothing to do with drugs that we can access um, through a lot of the things that we can't do now. But the book is very much about like, put your phone down, close your laptop, go outside, go be in nature, go hug a tree, go hug a person, go ha have eye contact with someone, smell their pheromones, uh, get naked, cuddle. So some of the recommendations in good chemistry are going to feel a little bit dated because like, oh yeah, well, you know, a month ago we could do that, but now we can't. Um, but we will eventually get back to a place where we can smell each other and take in people's auras um, and, and hug and dance together and cry in each other's arms uh, and grieve and connect. And that will be a beautiful thing. Certainly. And when can people expect? <laughs> Just don't uh, ask me book. when. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> like, I don't know when we can hug, but the book yeah. is the Good Chemistry. Yeah. will come out it, it's going to come out in the middle of june june 16th and you know you can already order it on on amazon or any uh, any um less evil format than that that you would like to find although i don't really want to bad mouth amazon at the moment because where yeah. would we be without our deliveries certainly i mean uh julie dr julie holland thank you so much for joining me today i'm looking forward so much to reading your book um and you know one more question. How about that? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, so how do you think that these more ecstatic techniques of experiencing connection like LSD could reform the way we think about religion? How could this um, revitalize the idea of religion or having religious experiences in yeah. our society? Well, I, that's a great question. I think, you know, the, I guess the word I'm thinking, pardon me, um, that's a really great question. And the, and the word that really comes to mind first and foremost for me is, a, is sort of like a democratization. Um, you know, the, the way religion was always set up in the past is like, you know, one guy gets to talk to God and then that guy tells everybody else what God says. And so, you know, the thing about uh, psychedelics is that you get to directly experience whatever you think God is, that, you know, you have a direct one-to-one -one experience that is not mediated through somebody else telling you what it's supposed to be or what, you know, what their experience is. So that is a real, um, um, it's almost like a socialist way, like, Everybody gets it, not just the elite. Everybody has access to God if you want it. Um, and, you know, I, when I say God, I am, I'm not talking about like, a, you know, a white man and with a beard and a robe. Um, um, I mean, you know, everybody has their own sort of higher power or whatever. I mean, I, you know, my higher power is, is nature, basically, because my idea is that like a, a tornado is more powerful than I am. So I can, I can give up my power to a tornado pretty easily. So, um, so that uh, this idea that you can directly experience uh, whatever you feel like God is, or whatever whatever that that potent pool of energy is, um, you know, the other thing I think for me, and I think for a lot of people um, that have had really uh, intense psychedelic experiences, is that we we maybe are not as afraid to die as other people have because we have had these experiences of not existing. Um, of having our energy sort of dissipate or or join a pool of other energies, you know, and a lot of us have come away from these mystical experiences of, of the void and the light um, with a sense of bliss that like, oh, you know, not existing feels pretty good. 
like, you know, you're going to like it. So I, I think that there are some of us who are walking around or are a little bit less afraid to die than other people. And, um, and I do consider that some, somehow a, a religious experience. Um, and it all I'm, starts with finding the good chemistry. Right. Which, you know, everybody has access to. Hey, I wanted to tell you about one thing is, um, you know, I write a lot about music and good chemistry. I'm a musician and uh, I've, uh, I married a musician and our kids are genetically predisposed to be musicians because that's how we wanted it. Uh, and when they were really young, we had this family band and one of our very first gigs as a family band, we we're called Family Mojo because my daughter Molly and my son Joe. So one of the earliest gigs Family Mojo had was at Chapel of Sacred Mirrors. Um, and Another really early gig we had was actually at an art fair, very close to where Cosm is in, yeah. in Wappingers. So uh, we've got some really early footage when the kids are like four and eight years old where we're playing at Cosm. But we also, uh, more recently, we made a video, uh, the first reunion tour of yes. Family Mojo, and we made a, yes. a video of a song that we that that we. We made a video of a song that, that we thought was sort of appropriate for Bicycle Day, although it doesn't specifically mention LSD. Um, well, White Rabbit, I mean, but, everyone knows. <laughs> so we, we made a video of White Rabbit that my daughter Molly uh, directed and shot in my son Joe's bedroom. It features, yeah. the, features the artwork of my husband and my cousin. But if anybody wants to take a look, it's just kind of a fun, our fun take on, uh, on White Rabbit. Yeah. The forced reunion tour. I love that. Right. <laughs> Very yeah. apropos. Uh, well, hey, Dr. Julie Holland, thank you so much for coming on the Cosm podcast. It's been very illuminating. Um, and I'm looking forward to reading Good Chemistry when it comes out. Well, enjoy, Tyler. It was great to talk to you. And please give my love to Alex and Allison. Thanks again for listening to the Cosm Podcast. To learn more about Dr. Julie Holland, visit her website, naturalmood.com. And be sure to check out her books on Amazon. Her latest book, Good Chemistry, is available for pre-order now. To learn more about Cosm, please visit cosm.org. And be sure to follow Chapel of Sacred Mirrors on Instagram and Facebook to stay up to date on future podcasts and virtual events. Please consider making a donation. A contribution of any size is a stand for Cosm to continue to bring inspiring and uplifting offerings to the love tribe. And thank you to Decca for the soundtrack to this podcast. You can find Decca on YouTube, Spotify, and Bandcamp. And now to close this out is the Family Mojo with their rendition of White Rabbit by Jefferson Airplane. <laughs>